Today is the second last day of our non-proliferation disarmament summer school. And before introducing our speakers for the next very interesting panel, let me do a quick recap. Um, you would recall that this week we started uh, discussing um, the non-proliferation challenges, specifically focusing on North Korea and Iran. We then had a full session on the CTBT, including a very technical lecture by a senior CTBTO official. And then yesterday, I think, was one of the highlights, as far as I'm concerned, this week, where we had, first of all, an excellent lecture by Dr. Nikolai Sokov on uh, arms control. Um, and I think everyone would agree that was, that was quite uh, interesting and very engaging. And then uh, the second session yesterday uh, was certainly um, very, very useful and very exciting. We had um, three panelists, including uh, Paula um, and um, Beatrice Finn from ICANN and one of our own uh, master's degree students, uh, but they were all involved in the negotiations of the TPNW, and uh, this was a very exciting panel. So today, um, we have an equally interesting and two very, very engaging and very experienced um, panelists that will be discussing with, with us the importance of nuclear security and the prevention of nuclear terrorism. So I will briefly, as per our practice so far, very briefly introduce the panelists and then ask them to give their talks one after the other without uh, interrupting by, by myself. And then we'll go into a Q&A. Just to remind everyone, please post your questions in the Q&A box. We will uh, allow you to ask your question in person if you wish to do so. And then depending on the number of questions, we'll take a few rounds, a few questions, and then one we'll have a round of, of answers. So let me first introduce, we, who probably does not need introduction because she has been on the um, course before, but uh, she, and she's also very active, of course, in, in, in the region, but um, Irma Arguello is the founder and chair of the NPS Global Foundation and head of uh, the Latin American Caribbean Leadership Network. Uh, Irma holds a uh, degree in physics, an MBA, uh, and has worked extensively in the area of international security. Um, and she is uh, an expert also in fissile material issues, and in particular, as far as this topic of today is concerned, she participated in as a official non in the official non-governmental uh, events on the side of the nuclear security summits. So we look forward to your presentation, Irma. Then it's also a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, a dear friend and a colleague from um, CNS, Elena Sokova, is the executive director of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Arbitration, which is the CNS um, office in Vienna. Uh, she was also the deputy director here at, in Monterey. Um, and prior to that, she founded the, the Vienna Center in, um, in, in Vienna. Uh, and she liked it so much, she had to go back. And I don't blame her. It is a lovely, a lovely city. Uh, Vienna itself is um, an expert in um, fissile material issues, um, and she done a lot of work on traffic of nuclear radioactive waste, um, as well as uh, non-proliferation issues in Euro-Asia. The last point that I'd like to mention about Melena is she's also a graduate of the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. So with that introduction, uh, we look forward to your presentation. So Irma, may I invite you to start? Oh, thank you very much, uh, John. I'm glad to be with you again in this panel about prevention of nuclear terrorism and nuclear security. Doubly glad because I, I appreciate very much Elena, who will be a panelist with me. It's a topic very close, as you said, uh, to my experience, and mostly after the first nuclear security summit 10 years ago. As a member of the steering committee of the Design Material Working Group, I participated in the organization of the four so-called knowledge summits the official expert meetings on the site of the Nuclear Security Summit. Also, several research groups on the topics, such as the Nuclear Security Governance Special Group, 
and also with Elena in the Nuclear Security Council of the World Economic <coughs> Forum, excuse me. I saw this time the evolution of global worries about nuclear terrorism. Many efforts done worldwide to prevent a potential response to any malicious act involving nuclear material, radiological sources and facilities. Today, with the world facing COVID-19 pandemic, priorities seem to be different, but the terrorist threat is always there. And prevention is just that, to anticipate the catastrophic act, reducing risk in advance. Uh, we will address here nuclear risk. We will focus in the worst scenario, uh, the detonation of an IND, an improvised nuclear device, because if we are prepared for the worst, it, it's all right, we are prepared for everything. We will focus also on the effects and on what to do from our countries to reduce the risk and to be uh, an active part of the global effort to prevent nuclear terrorism. So uh, I will share with you a presentation to, to go through all of these topics. Uh, just give me a second, share screen. Okay, we will start with an overview of nuclear risks. As you know, nuclear risks are from different nature. Uh, uh, first, you have the, the risk derived from the possession and use of nuclear weapons. Uh, it includes the deliberate use by states, the detonation by accidents, error, miscalculation, and of course, another risk, but uh, very unlikely but present, is the theft by terrorists for, of a nuclear weapon. Then you have the risk associated to nuclear facilities and materials that are relevant in 14 states as per an NTI index uh, 2018. Uh, and then uh, I can say that an NTI index 2020 will be launched on July 22. So I, I am a part of the expert group, uh, the, the advisory group for the, for the NTI index. So I invite you and I can uh, give you a link to, to, be partici to participate in the launch of, uh, on July 22 of NTI Index 2020. Well, uh, when you, you talk about uh, risk uh, associated with facility and materials, you can think on theft of nuclear weapon usable materials like plutonium and HU high um, enriching uranium from sites. Uh, and these sites are from different degrees of uh, protection. So you have uh, sites around the world that are protected by the armies, uh, another site protects for the police, another from uh, protect by private companies. So uh, it's, uh, there is no standard about protection of these many nuclear sites where these uh, weapons usable materials are storage. Then you, you can, and, and most likely, you can have the test of a radioactive source that are globally distributed in almost any country around the world. And all this uh, could be used for proliferation use that I, I won't address that, but mostly for terrorist acts. You can, when you talk about nuclear terrorism, you talk about intrusion, sabotage, or attacks to facilities including more recently the risk of uh, cyber attacks. The, as, as I mentioned, the improvised nuclear device, uh, also called fission crude bomb of low yield, of low uh, power, and also uh, the radiological dispersal device, RDD, that is uh, the combination of a uh, powerful radi radioactive source and conventional explosive. All that is the the big universe of nuclear risk. Um, we will focus mostly in, in these parts, the, the theft of nuclear weapons, the theft of radioactive sources, and the, their use in, in, uh, in the, the attacks uh, against facilities and, and the, the fabrication of 
uh, an AND or RDD. When you talk uh, about the region, our region, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, we are a region of free or nuclear weapons, so we, we don't have the, the risk of use uh, in any of our countries of, the, of, a, um, of a nuclear weapon or the death of a nuclear weapon in our countries. But we have uh, facilities, many facilities around the region, enrichment technology in Brazil and Argentina, and of course, radiological sources all over the region. So, to these risks, we should add what we call the risk environment for nuclear terrorism and organized crime, that are non nuclear components of the race. We have in the region states with political instability, ineffective governments, we, we have the, the, the bad situation corruption in many countries, weak judiciary systems, impunity, totalitarian governments, and many countries or space or regions controlled by organized crime. So uh, our region could be perfectly an immediate uh, intermediate point for illicit trade of these nuclear materials or radiological sources, or even as a terrorist haven like, for example, uh, the triple border between Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil. With this uh, landscape, we will talk a little about how plausible is a nuclear terrorist attack. Um, the terrorism in 21st century has been uh, so far conventional, but Groups as Al Qaeda or ISIS openly declare their intention to acquire and use weapons of mass destruction. To give just an example, if we talk about Islamic terrorism between 2013 and, and 30, 10, 2019, we have uh, a big, a big quantity of attacks, more than 23,000, with uh, a lot of deaths. Uh, here we have a, a problem with this number because it's uh, two, uh, two, 20 uh, thousand deaths. There is a, a, a mistake here. But if we talk of Western country, we have had in the same period 600, more or less 600 deaths, and in Europe only 400 deaths in 113 attacks. So. Uh, the, 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 the issue is uh, to analyze for our specific topic, how plausible is to pass from conventional attacks to uh, a, a nuclear attack. Uh, we should know, and we will focus on uh, an AMD, that uh, it is a low probability event, but with a huge potential damage. Uh, therefore, in terms of prevention, should be treated or analyzed uh, as a high right risk event. If we, we see the, the path uh, of nuclear, uh, com from nuclear conventional attacks to nuclear terrorism, we, we could say that at the, what we have today is uh, a street attacks, conventional means, by lonely wolves or simple cells, very simple organizations. But um, in terms of prevention, we should analyze uh, further scenarios like, for example, for example, a chemical attack, a dirty bone or RDD, or even an attack of nuclear facility that would be the next step and would require more uh, sophisticated network. But, uh, after that, and in terms of probation, we should analyze another uh, scenario that it would be a sophisticated network to commit an IND attack or a bio attack. So this is an increasing degree of complexity to, uh, to reach this possibility. But we can, when we talk, we talk about Nuclear terrorists, we, we also talk about nuclear facility or the dirty bomb, and then, of course, the IND. So, 
The future revolution from the conventional to nuclear depends mostly on the change of mindset of nuclear current terrorist groups uh, to, to get a more sophisticated mindset from uh, because they, they have opted for low cost, so far low cost attacks. And the, the nuclear uh, terrorists require more sophistication, more funding, and of course, in, uh, more technology. But then it depends on the international and national practical barriers to prevent and counter terrorism and relate organized crime. In two sense, in the sense of reduced vulnerabilities and in the sense of neutralized threats. It implies a strong legal framework and its effective application and the intelligence to neutralize, neutralize the threat and both to working together. Let's go now uh, very briefly to the, what uh, could be the shape of a nuclear detonation and its effects. Yeah. What if terrorists detonate a small yield fission bomb in a capital city anywhere in the developed world? That is, the, uh, if they, they uh, detonate a bomb in any city in the in the emerging world, maybe the effect would be uh, um, a little bit less. But if the detonation is in a, in a capital city in the developed world, the, the consequence would be a reach a, a global, global level. So uh, it's important for our countries that we don't feel like it's a, a target of this kind of attack to analyze what would be the less obvious impacts for countries like ours beyond the expectable loss of life and destruction in the target country. In that, in what sense should chat could change the present and future, future dynamic of the world and the security? What would be the most appropriate uh, measures to reduce the risk? And how governments and international organizations and we as NGOs should positively uh, help to reduce such risks? Um, we put together some, some of the findings in a report that we, we wrote about the, the topic and it's available for, to, to download to links that it was called a terror leash or, or in Spanish terror desatado and it was presented in the second IAEA International Conference of Nuclear Security, the ICONS in December 2016. Um, this uh, would be the shape of um, an improvised uh, nuclear device, uh, gun types, uh, 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 very small yield uh, 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 artifact or device, and it would require uh, not, not more than 50 kilograms of HU, 90%. Um, this HU could be in a potential scenario stolen small amount from poorly protected facilities. As I told you, there are many facilities that are poorly protected around the world. It could be purchased by terrorists in the black market, shipped to a haven through weak borders, and it counts in our region very much. The IND build that is a very, very simple technology to build once you have the materials, this IND, and then detonate it in a big capital city in the developed world. As you can see, the first steps, uh, marked in red, uh, involve countries possessing fissile materials, weapons, weapons usable fissile materials, specifically HU of high degrees of enrichment. And that, the, the second, the, the yellow uh, part, implies steps involving any country in the world. So the, the message here is that all countries should involve in the uh, fight against nuclear terrorism because they, any country could be 
functional to the objective or the, these objectives. Uh, the, 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 the direct effects uh, of uh, one kiloton uh, IND are uh, broadly known, but you, you have here all the, the region or the, the space, the area that could be affected in the, in the target city. And you have here the, the death toll the, depending on the population density and geography. But we will focus mostly in the, in the indirect effects. So these indirect effects uh, could be analyzed in four main strategic dimensions, security and defense, economy, the world and national and regional economies, international relations, government and society is the, the psychosocial uh, effects. If we go to security and defense, the, the key question is, would a nuclear terrorist attack bring together or divide the international community? It's a big question, but uh, the, what is expected is an increase of global distrust and consequent tensions, an increase of pressure for a strong military response, and mostly, if any sponsor, any state sponsor of the terrorist group is identified. But of course, it could be tied to an increase of global surveillance and unilateralism in the use of weapons, being that conventional or nuclear. And of course, for protection, states will incur in, in dramatic increase of military expenditure. And in the worst scenario, that is very, was a, a very interesting finding from one terrorist attack in, uh, and in a very, in the worst uh, sub-scenario could even uh, uh, derive on a potential nuclear exchange between states. So, we we know where it starts but we don't know where it ends so the most important thing is that uh, such attack never happened in terms of economy and finance uh, we studied uh, uh, and of course it would lead to lead to a severe global economic depression uh, and in terms of uh, what we are seen about COVID-19 uh, and uh, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, estimates for this year a depression of uh, 4.9% 4 uh, in, the, in, the in the global, in the growth of uh, minus, in the global growth of uh, GDP. We, we had calculated 2% fall, and I think that uh, today, seeing the effect of COVID-19, that we, we've been very, very conservative. But uh, together with the depression on, in global or grow, on the decay of global GDP, would be uh, associated a uh, fall in international trade, increase of global poverty, global storage of high-tech products, including medicine, and severe reduction of humanitarian aid to less developed countries, even more than with the COVID-19 pandemics, because the COVID-19 pandemic it, it leads states to, to be solidarian with other states. But the, a nuclear terrorist attack would be uh, practically an, an act of war. So it's, uh, it's difficult to uh, anticipate if the, the states would be uh, as solidarian as uh, they, we, we think that they will be with COVID-19. Here we have the graphic and uh, well, uh, we what uh, what I told about the the growth of GDP. I will I will leave this presentation for you to analyze 
in detail after this. So, in terms of international relationships, uh, surely the change would be very, very drastic. Uh, and there would be a, a very big uh, destabilization, destabilization and, and probably um, all the international system that is the basis of nuclear order will be put uh, under trial. Uh, in terms of government and societies, what we expect of uh, an event of this uh, nature, uh, global panic, fear, uncertainty, governments threatened at all levels, the situation, situation put the state, the government and the social order in every country. And there would be, as a response, probably a severe rest restriction of individual freedom as we are seeing with the COVID-19 lockdown. So, the conclusions of this, uh, this analysis is that no country in possession either nuclear weapons or nuclear weapon usable materials can guarantee their full protection against nuclear terrorism or nuclear smuggling, organized crime. Nor it is realistic, that is very important, to conceive uh, that those countries could compensate others or because uh, of the damage or be, uh, and the derived of any country's acts or omission. And it is very important then to, to establish the, the rules for a, a, a fair system to prevent nuclear terrorism. Then, uh, you know, as I told you, that even countries that do not possess nuclear weapons, uh, in neither facilities or neither materials could be, can be functional because of their intrinsic uh, vulnerabilities or weakness. So, uh, to the, the response of the international community to this threat uh, is, uh, is uh, in the in the area of nuclear security i will just give here the the nuclear security definition uh, through uh, uh, that appears at the iea nuclear security glossary is the prevention and detection and response to theft sabotage unauthorized access illegal transfer or other malicious acts involving nuclear material other radioactive substance or their associate facilities. As you can see, this definition involves all what you have been uh, 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 going through in the in the form slides. And this is the current nuclear security architecture. I, I will talk about this because Elena will address specifically all this. But as you can see, it's a, a, very, a constellation of many international legal instruments. Many of them are non-binding, nor, nor, nor they are voluntary or voluntary adherence. And there is also the action of many international and national organizations. I leave all this to, to Elena that will address the point. But I, I want to to address uh, how we envision, uh, and there is a, a big uh, agreement uh, among the expert community, uh, that how the key functionalities of a robust global nuclear security system would be. First, it will define a set of minimum nuclear security standards and look for their universal acceptance. Today, nuclear security is uh, an exclusive uh, sovereign uh, decision of any state uh, around the world. But if you don't have a minimum nuclear security standard, and the states commit to, the, to it, it's very difficult to have uh, a robust uh, system because uh, it's like a chain that you have uh, weak uh, links. Then uh, the support of univer the universal implementation of the, the, the key um, legal instrument. 
uh, it would seek the full penetration of weapon suitable materials, not only in civilian facilities, but also in non-civilian facilities, of course. Also, the, the nuclear facilities themselves, the radiological cells, and of course, the information. Um, also, um, a robust global nuclear security system would encourage transparency and shared best practice while protecting countries' critical information. That is one of the main concerns of those countries that don't want to, to adopt a common standard and a, a transparent a transparency of information. Of course, it should promote the minimization and further elimination of HU and separate plutonium, civilian and non-civilian, with the aid of technology, and of course should be enough flexible to provide adequate response for the future evolution of nuclear threat, including cyber terrorism. If, how to make it possible? Of course, the first thing is the awareness in government of, about the global dimension of the threat, uh, although it has a low probability. Uh, we should remember that it has a, a high risk. The second and key point, and mostly for our states in Latin America and the Caribbean, that we don't feel a target of this attack, is understand the concrete ways in which nuclear terrorism could affect our national interests. We all be affected by uh, this, uh, the international crisis derived of uh, this kind of attack anywhere in the world. Of course, countries should be committed to implement the set of national measures and to bind themselves to a minimal acceptable set of agreed nuclear security rules. And of course, uh, take into account that, the, 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 that this uh, kind of nuclear attacks could be not, ju not just national, but regional or even global uh, reach. Countries should become accountable for, to others for their nuclear security decisions for act or omission. Finally, the chains and opportunities for Latin America and the Caribbean. The first thing is, and mostly in our position, to keep the issue high in the government uh, agenda. Uh, so it is important for government officials, for diplomats as you, to have uh, a, key, a, a clear awareness of impact and the understanding of how it would uh, evolve. Of course, to integrate the region under the common risk reduction practices, the national implementation of international commitment. Uh, we have a very diverse situation in the region, um, countries that with all the international, the key international commitment implemented and other even not signatories or, or, or without ratification on many of them. The improve, of course, the, the non-nuclear risk environment issues that is, is a, a very a big endeavor in the, in, the, in the world for many, many countries in the region, but is absolutely necessary and promote the full integration of nuclear security issue on the MPT review process because they underlie the three pillars of the MPT. And of course, increase the participation in regional international cooperative efforts to reduce security risks. So, uh, I, I leave you uh, some information here for further reading and the links of the, um, this report released that uh, goes uh, much more in depth that uh, is the, the small uh, the time we have for presentations. And of course, I, I remain open for your questions and comments. Thank you very much.
Jean, should I go ahead? Please go ahead, Elena. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, um, I want to say welcome to all of you who are participating in the uh, meeting, in this online <laughs> experimental course, summer school. Uh, I wish I could, we all could gather in Mexico City and enjoy uh, your hospitable capital there, but um, the nature had its own plans for us this year. But I've been to Mexico City to a number of previous summer schools and it's always a great program and uh, so many engaged and interested diplomats who are eager to learn about uh, all the nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament issues. But I'm grateful for this opportunity to also to connect with my friends, at least virtually, with both with Jean and with Irma. I dearly miss you, but I hope that maybe next year we'll have a chance to if not in Mexico, to see each other at some other meetings and conferences. Um, but I'll jump into my presentation right away because I understand we are a little bit constrained in terms of the time and we need to leave time for Q&A. So a few things. Uh, first of all, Irma, many thanks for your presentation. You set all this scene and uh, all the questions perfectly for my part of the presentation, as if we practiced before. The few things that <laughs> I would, we worked long enough together. Uh, the few points that I would probably like to add to uh, kind of link our presentations and um, add to what Irma has already touched upon is the following. Nuclear security is not only about nuclear terrorism prevention. This is one and a very big part of it, and it's the risks that Irma went uh, through with you are indeed high. But uh, nuclear security as a tool to prevent uh, the theft, the uh, uh, sabotage, and many other uh, possible malicious acts with nuclear and radioactive materials is uh, something that we should all be concerned because something could be done inadvertently. It could be done not necessarily for terrorism purposes, but it could be done for other criminal purposes. Just let me give you a couple of examples. One of them, for example, uh, the use of radioactive materials to really do harm to your competitor. Uh, like there are a couple of cases we know where one businessman didn't like the other businessman and the radioactive material was planted in a chair or in the ceiling and the person uh, obviously uh, uh, develops cancer and dies. Um, but there are cases where some of these rare materials were just left uh, unattended or disposed of improperly and became just a public and environmental hazard. Uh, actually, in, in your region, in Brazil, in 1987, there was a case in Goiania where a former hospital was uh, being dismantled, a new uh, hospital was built and all the equipment was moved to the new one, but a big teletherapy machine using cesium-137 was left behind and no one took out the radioactive source from this machine. Uh, this source, somebody found the machine, found this interesting object with the radioactive material in it. Uh, the material ended up uh, in a scrap metal shop uh, without going into details. Then uh, people discovered it, opened it up. It's a shiny silverish powder with some glow. Uh, people were excited, didn't know what they are dealing with. Uh, four people were dead, more than 120 people were injured. Uh, there were more than 100 people who had to go through medical checks. There was the containment of the area. The, uh, it's a pretty large uh, populated area. 
And it took about five years for this little town to go back to uh, its previous kind of economic development. Uh, so the damage was huge just from this little uh, source where it was still very early contained. Thankfully, one of the uh, doctors in the hospital immediately recognized the burns on people's skin as a radioactive material burn. So if it were not the case, the damage could have been much larger. And it wasn't a terrorist attack. It was just a very small incident. So nuclear security is important. And it's important for, obviously, for the prevention of nuclear terrorism, but it's also for the prevention of uh, safety and security of humans and environment as well. And to that point, I want to uh, make another uh, very important observation is sometimes uh, as the regime covering nuclear security developed and there are new requirements, new conventions and reporting mechanisms, there is a, a natural pushback against of the, some of these measures because they are adding to the work of the, both the organizations that use these materials, also to the governments for reporting. But what we really need to keep in mind, if we are thinking about the uh, sustainable use of nuclear technology, be it nuclear power, be it the use of radioactive and nuclear materials for science, for agriculture, for industrial development, we really need to make sure that we do everything properly, whether it's safety, whether it's security, whether it's adherence to the uh, uh, non-proliferation safeguards norms. I know you've had probably spent more time on um, non-proliferation and uh, uh, safeguards issues than on nuclear security, but I think it is very important to uh, think about it as also an integral part of overall nuclear governance. Uh, so I have some slides and I will share on my screen with you, uh, but I'll try to go through them relatively quickly. So what Irma said and what I want to, uh, did I do it right or not? Uh, did I share the screen? Okay. Okay, now I did. Um, we can see it. You can see it? Yes. Okay, so what Irma said uh, correctly, and I want to highlight one more time, is that the responsibility for nuclear security lies within the state. Uh, the way the nuclear security regime developed is uh, uh, basically the regime developed a little bit behind some other regimes. If you think about the nuclear safeguards and other arrangements regarding nuclear materials, uh, nuclear security came a little bit later into the international arena, and I'll explain how it developed. So to, to a large degree, if you think about the uh, non-proliferation, you have the International Atomic Energy Agency, you have the safeguard system, the inspections that are mandatory, that are all prescribed and very seriously uh, implemented. With nuclear security, it is the responsibility of the state the, even the International Atomic Energy Agency plays a very significant role in providing guidance, different services to the member states, but it doesn't go and check in any country how they do in terms of nuclear security arrangement. So that we need to keep in mind. But what you also said correctly, we do need some common standards and methodology. How do we uh, provide for nuclear security? We're also dealing with non-state actors that don't recognize the borders. And we also need to make sure that we, we want to have some assurance that uh, our neighbor or some other states are doing proper job 
in securing their materials and facilities. Um, also within a state, your state may take obligation under the international convention or some other document, but then it needs to make sure that it's operators of nuclear facilities, that regulators and the industry are also doing their part of the job, that they're implementing uh, all these regulations correctly. Um, as I mentioned, that nuclear security regime developed uh, in, in several steps and it came a little bit later than uh, we saw the establishment of non-proliferation regime and the Treaty of Non-Proliferation. And I usually uh, recognize like four different, three different catalysts uh, that helped to shape the regime. First, um, the 70s and the 90s where there were a number of really high uh, profile terrorism um, acts and activities, including assassinations, kidnapping, aircraft hijacking, um, both in Europe and North America and Northern Africa as well. One of the well-known uh, cases is the massacre at the Munich Olympic Games. So this whole uh, rise of uh, terrorism, including international terrorism, really had the governments uh, with nuclear materials and facilities start thinking about the protection of their uh, assets in this respect. And also think about the movement of materials from one country to another. The second uh, catalyst for the nuclear security regime was the basically the breakdown of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s and then uh, loss of controls over the materials, facilities. You had instead of one, one state with huge nuclear infrastructure and weapons, you suddenly have 15 straight states uh, some of them inherited in weapons and materials and facilities, but no uh, governmental control practically, no legislation, no borders. So that was another big event. Um, and I will demonstrate to you how this event triggered various developments in the international system. And the, the third catalyst event is obviously the 2001 September 11 attacks on the United States which uh, really demonstrated uh, at that time willingness of the uh, terrorists to non-state actors to uh, go under uh, after a mass casualty terrorism. Uh, first of all, second of all, the evidence uh, uh, found both in Taliban caves and some other places uh, interest to WMD. So no wonder this period really uh, triggered another wave of new rules, new conventions. Um, going back to the catalyst, uh, first catalyst uh, related to the nuclear, to sorry, terrorism uh, activities in the 70s and 80s, really triggered two big things in the regime that established the foundation of nuclear security. One, the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, for the first time developed recommendations for the physical protection of nuclear materials and facilities. For those who work in this area know this famous INSERT 225. So it literally was the first attempt to create some standards and methodology how to uh, secure materials and facilities. At the same time, st countries started negotiating the Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials that first and foremost was addressing the uh, security of materials in transit and how to deal with uh, 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 materials that were smuggled and stolen. Um, then in the 90s we had another, uh, as I mentioned, uh, big impact on the security system and thinking the collapse of the Soviet Union and at that time uh, because of this uh, at that time a high level of trafficking cases from the former Soviet Union and I'll show you the slide later 
there were cases not only involving radioactive materials and materials of uh, nuclear materials that are of lower quality, but also materials of uh, highly used uranium and plutonium. The materials, the very materials needed for the nuclear weapons uh, construction. What Irma was referring to, that improvised nuclear device that they, they, the terrorists could construct was precisely the material of direct use for, for that. So what has been done at that time is, first of all, the International Atomic Energy Agency established a tracking mechanism of all these illicit trafficking cases. Um, they also, the agency also started offering various advisory services and missions to the states. Even though they, it's not mandatory, the state itself need to invite uh, this mission and uh, uh, um, have them at the, in the country and have the mission assess uh, how its protection is being done of the materials and facilities. It also developed additional recommendations, not only for the physical protection, but also how to count materials and how to control them. The many uh, things that are nowadays the basis of this entire uh, network and framework for uh, nuclear security were developed in the 90s. And at the first time, the International Atomic Energy actually established an office, separate office dealing with nuclear security. Before it was part of the nuclear safeguards uh, department, um, then uh, nuclear safety and security. And the first time when we had even an office dealing with these issues. So that slide uh, just wanted to show you that indeed we look at, if you look at the timeline in the early mid 90s, you have uh, highly niched uranium and plutonium smuggling cases. Uh, all of this material was originated in the former Soviet Union. And you will see there are uh, high quantities, for example, uh, in 94, I see St. Petersburg, three kilograms of 90% highly enriched uranium. This is a perfect material for a nuclear bomb. It's still not enough, three kilograms, but when uh, uh, some of these smugglers who were actually caught with the materials claim that they have another 100 kilograms somewhere uh, in their garage available for sale, you start to think about these things really seriously. Then you can see we, we have a trend uh, of the number of cases going down. And then we see that like the latest uh, incidents involve like 4.4 grams of highly enriched uranium, which is on one hand good news. That it means that if there is something maybe leftovers from that early era, what is circulating. It's very small quantities. On the other hand, it's still a very high concern telling us that something is still out there and we don't know. But overall, I think that uh, early 90s triggered not only a whole set of new norms and development of standards and agreements, but also a number of programs. It was a very, international effort with the, led by the United States uh, to help form the Soviet Union to secure materials and facilities. But due to the lack of time, I'll skip that. Um, but it wasn't only the Soviet Union that was a problem or the post-Soviet time. Um, many other countries had their own share of various uh, incidents and attacks. For example, in South Africa in 1982, an insider uh, was uh, uh, able to plant explosives in a, at a nuclear power plant and it was uh, before actually any material, radioactive material was introduced to it. Aum Shinrikyo, a religious cult in Japan, before they uh, uh, carried out a Zarin gas attack in Tokyo Metro 
they will look into shopping for nuclear weapons and materials. Al Qaeda, already mentioned by um, Irma, and other cases um, you can see here. When obviously after 9 11, uh, a number of other uh, responses were introduced. And first of all, uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 1540 uh, that actually closed that gap uh, where most of the treaties and convention, as you know, deal with states and states' behavior, states' obligations. But what UN Security Council Resolution 1540 did for the first time, it actually made states responsible uh, for doing everything they could to deny access to WMD to non-state actors. So they basically need to know and to establish the rules within their system, legal system, and to effectively establish controls, physical protection, and everything else that relates to the whole downloading due controls issues within their states. Uh, there are a number of other conventions that were adopted, uh, including International Convention for the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism. Um, there were many initiatives that were put in place, including the Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism. You will see the list and many others. Many of the documents were amended and the convention that was uh, and, or Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials, which uh, was uh, initially uh, entered into force in uh, 1987, um, in 2005, it was amended to include very important part uh, so that now states are responsible for the security of their materials and facilities on their territories, not only for the materials in tra transit and shipment. Uh, you would think that it's logical, it should have been there from the start, but it wasn't. It only took some of these extreme events to uh, close some of these gaps. And I will speak about some other uh, issues very quickly. I will provide my slides and you can uh, probably go through them if you want to learn more about all these various international instruments from the Convention of the Physical Protection to uh, various other convention and treaties. What I would probably I focus more on other instruments. So in the international system, we have some, uh, as we call it hard law, the convention and treaties that everybody is, uh, they're mandatory in countries who subscribe to them, should implement uh, them. And then we have a body of these more soft arrangements, voluntary arrangements. Uh, and part of them really focuses on various code of conducts on some other arrangements that country or obligations that countries take upon them. And uh, Irma has already mentioned that code of conduct that the International Atomic Energy uh, maintains and countries subscribe to um, that relates to the safety and security of radioactive sources. It's not binding, but there are 130 states that subscribe to it and implement all the guidances that come with it. Um, in addition, the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, does a very important work in uh, developing various recommendations and technical documents, how states could implement, what are they methodologies and uh, what are the uh, different ways of approaching uh, certain security issues. And as I mentioned, the advisory and evaluation services uh, became a regular part of the agency's work since uh, mid 1990s. What countries do is uh, ask for these peer review uh, missions ask the agency and its expert to do, uh, to come and check on this legal, regulatory infrastructure, physical protection or materials control and accounting, or even develop the whole plan for the country and how to do it. And obviously the agency provides assistance with equipment, training, 
and uh, maintains that database to this day. Um, in addition to some of the conventions and the uh, voluntary measures, there are a number of international initiatives that both keep the focus on the issues, but also provide assistance to many states in dealing with uh, some of the uh, remaining issues or helping with establishing regulatory, um, sometimes even the regulatory itself, the body, but also various documents and inter legislation, or even helping with the equipment or training uh, for nuclear security. And one of the initiatives uh, that I would uh, quickly uh, focus on is the Nuclear Security Summits. Uh, that was the initiative that uh, came out of the famous President Barack Obama's Prague speech. It focuses on many issues, including disarmament, but uh, it also had a big segment on uh, nuclear security. Uh, what is interesting and important that original focus of this initiative was to really deal with highly enriched uranium and plutonium as materials for nuclear weapons. Uh, the idea was to invite all the states that have these materials and have a summit at the level of heads of states. But the number of parties grew because it was also important to engage countries who are major shipping hubs so that they can uh, also work on it or countries that had uh, a high number of illicit trafficking cases. So in the end, there were like 47 different heads of states. Um, over the years, a couple of additional states were added also United Nations, IEA, European Union, Interpol, four parties of it. Initially, the idea was to have one meeting, kind of bring the attention at the very top level to the issue. But it turns into a series. We had four um, nuclear security summits in a row. Uh, and overall, I would say the nuclear security summits did move the issue forward. There were many different achievements that were a result of the work of the summits. Uh, one of the innovations um, for the work of the summits was that the Americans uh, who were planning the first meetings, meeting in Washington in 2010, uh, created that system of um, Sherpas and Sioux Sherpas that prepare the meeting, but their work was also to bring to this to the summit some concrete um, actions, commitments uh, in the form of the house gifts. As if you invite a guest to a house, they always bring a bouquet or chocolates or wine. So the Americans said, "Don't bring us wine. Bring us." A commitment to convert your your reactor from highly enriched uranium to low enriched uranium or a commitment to open a training center on nuclear security or ratify the amended convention on physical protection and everything else and this system actually really worked um, a number of uh, achievements were made during that period first of all the uh, 16 plus countries became free of highly enriched uranium and actually during that time uh, Latin America has become highly enriched uranium free. Um, uh, one of the last kind of big, uh, well not that big but uh, still there was a significant amount of HEU in Chile at one of the research reactors that was repatriated at that time and some other small quantities here and there. So. Even uh, in many regions, uh, the, the progress was really, really well, um, the, well achieved. Um, most important also the convention, on, the amended convention entered into force on the CPPNM uh, training centers and 
also very important, the role of the International Atomic Energy Agency really, really was substantially elevated. Uh, countries felt that it, if maybe 10 years ago there were still discussions uh, about at the IAEA uh, uh, among the member states whether nuclear security even in a mandate of the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. Nowadays, there is no one even questions it, um, that it is part and um, uh, an integral part of the work of the agency. There are still some other tensions between uh, how much budget goes and uh, towards uh, nuclear security versus technical cooperation or maybe some other um, issues, but um, no one really questions that. At the same time, uh, summits could be criticized for several things. First of all, it was st still a selective nature. It wasn't like every country at the table. And some uh, countries uh, said, like, we should have contributed to the discussion. Um, second, the uh, summit didn't really deal much with the security of military materials in the world. That was primarily about civilian and military materials are actually 83% oil, highly enriched uranium and plutonium. Um, I would also say that uh, towards the last uh, summit, you cannot get the heads of state to meet every two years and focus on the same issue. Uh, that was really tiring. Uh, and also, uh, of created a fatigue with all sorts of uh, uh, nuclear security initiatives and summits and everything else. And also a very good critique uh, was that you uh, were able to keep the attention of uh, half of the world's uh, kind of population or more than half of the world population, half of the countries of the world uh, for four years and summits on this issue, but where is the summit on nuclear disarmament and just in general progress on nuclear disarmament? So there are many of these issues were um, obviously put on the table um, and continue to be um, maybe prevented more of the outcomes from these nuclear security summits to be more widely accepted, let me put it this way. What do we have nowadays? Uh, we still have some trafficking cases. They do not cease. Maybe there were fewer cases involving highly enriched uranium and plutonium, but there's still plenty of cases with radioactive materials. And, you know, if you look at your own region, you know, almost every year there are reports, say, uh, of a material, radioactive material source stolen, usually, it's stolen together with a vehicle where it was transported. So transportation in general is a very weak link in nuclear security. In addition to that, we have uh, new challenges in the cyber and information security. So for a sabotage of a facility, you may not necessarily need to be there physically. Um, new technologies like drones, uh, then we already seen uh, drones use both, not only for the observation, surveillance of facilities, but also for uh, the delivery of at least small amount of radioactive material on a drone was delivered to the Japanese Prime Minister's office building by one of the uh, disgruntled, disgruntled protesters. Uh, we still have uh, terrorism on the rise um, in many corners of the world from uh, Middle East, obviously, but it's also in Latin America and Africa and other places. Increased te technical capabilities of non-state actors is, is another factor that we really need to um, look into. We also now have uh, all these artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and their ability to identify vulnerabilities. I'm sure you're all reading the news, these days how the Twitter accounts were hacked uh, for some of the big names and celebrities, including uh, Elon Musk and Kardashians, 
Um, and there you go. Here's another way of uh, thinking about how these vulnerabilities uh, could be exploited by non-state actors to get access to nuclear weapons or materials. And another one is all this fake news and information that comes with it that we will also could play a role in uh, triggering some, an event uh, that um, uh, that could generate a real response, say, with nuclear weapon or just in general with weapons to something, to an event that actually did not happen or uh, it is a kind of masked event. So there are many of these new challenges that we need to think about, but I'll stop here and uh, hope we'll have some questions for some time for the Q&As. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena and Irma, for two um, very interesting lectures, very important lectures, and very comprehensive. And I just want to um, emphasize what both of you said, that your, the lecture material will be available on the course platform. So thank you for making that available. Uh, so far, we have one question. I have a few of my own, but um, I will read the question because uh, Pablo Inikin's microphone is not um, active. Uh, first, Pablo Inikin is a former CNS visiting fellow from Costa Rica. And so, Pablo, um, the context of, context of his question is that peaceful uses of nuclear energy are very important and issues such as food safety, food security, zoonotic disease, and medical diagnosis. And that these uh, involve sectors beyond the state, such as private enterprise and private laboratory. So, his question is, uh, in your opinion, um, are the main challenges, international challenges in the field of nuclear security in areas of peaceful uses of nuclear energy, such as agricultural medicine, and what recommendations can you give us diplomats to contribute to these dialogues that combine science and politics and that are successfully carried out in multilateral spaces such as the IEA, the WHO, and the FAO? So, you want to take a stab at that question, any one of you? Sure. Irma, do you want me to go ahead or you? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, you, and then I. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it is not as such. Uh, thank you for the question. One of the projects we have here in Vienna at our center is specifically focused on uh, the discussion with diplomats who serve here in Vienna and who, who have to deal with the various IA issues, be it safeguards, security, peaceful uses. I uh, have a project that looks at various peaceful applications of nuclear technologies, materials, including radioactive materials, precisely for the food, for culture, for health, and uh, their intersection with nuclear security. Um, and what we're trying to do is to really speak and uh, make information accessible uh, about the technologies themselves, how are they being used, what are the benefits, but also highlight uh, the sustainability of the use of them, as I mentioned at the beginning, of safety, security, and other arrangements. One of the uh, challenges in how to have a better use of these technologies is uh, really goes down to the uh, costs and funding. You know, some of these materials are really inexpensive and it's for say um, in instrumentation in, in uh, geological uh, observation, oil exploration, but for the use of these materials, say, in medicine, for cancer diagnostics or for treatment, they usually come with expensive machines. You also need to have trained radiologists uh, and personnel. You need to also provide for the security. And then the costs become uh, really high. And it's really prohibitive for some of the uh, least developed countries. 
Like I've been uh, in Africa for a couple of meetings and um, the, the situation is really dire uh, in Africa in terms of ability to provide it to population. Some countries have no capacity at all to do it. They have no machines for diagnostics or for treatment. Other countries, they, even they have, it's not sufficient. It may be uh, like covering one fourth of the need. Uh, and there are other complicating issues. It's the harsh climate, it's the uh, instability of power and many others. So I would say there is a, a real need to put the, um, the achievements of nuclear science and technologies to the global uh, needs, particularly developmental needs. And we're so behind in that. Uh, it's in order for many countries, it's not only financial contribution to uh, buying the technology or training personnel how to do it, but it's also the investment in, uh, into its regulatory system. Because without a regulatory system, it's very difficult to imagine how a company that uh, produces these machines will be able to supply it. So, for diplomats to understand how it works and works with their regulators, work with their governments, it's really important to have these conversations. And uh, one of the projects that um, if you, uh, maybe I'll share a link with you, um, there was a conference organized with uh, Wilton Park and with our center's staff that focused on Africa first, about the use, peaceful uses of uh, nuclear materials. One of the findings was that many of the scientists who work in this area understand well the benefits of these technologies and what needs to be done. But it's sometimes very difficult to convey these messages to the policy makers and um, to make them aware both about the technologies, their benefits, but also what needs to be done in order for these technologies to function properly. I would say that's my kind of answer to your question. Yeah, You're right. I, I, I could add, uh, I completely agree with Elena's view of, of the issue. I, I would say, I summarize that the, the main challenge, uh, international challenge for peaceful uses is capacity building, mostly in regions that uh, are things very depressed and they are just entering the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And concretely, the role of diplomats, I think that is very, very important because they are in the middle of um, in, in national and international. So they, uh, they, they, can, they can get international information the international, this, uh, they can participate in these international uh, dialogues about, about the issues, and then they can transfer it to, the, to their national uh, environments. So I, I think that is very important, the role, uh, and the, the first step is uh, for them to participate in, in activities like this one, or the, our uh, international uh, program, and that also we have diplomas there, and we have scholarship. And the, the idea is that the, all begins with uh, understanding the issues, awareness first, and then understanding the issues, and then to put their, uh, that, those ideas into action. Just, just that because, Elena, you, you have said the most of, uh, of I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have um, so far two more questions, so I will give the floor to William. William Pierre, do uh, you wish to ans ask your question, please? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Jim uh, My question is for Mr. Gelo. Concerning, uh, you are, you've been talking about nuclear terrorism. So, is there a possibility for some problem in 
Middle East, as we know that in the this weekend there are so many um 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 men that are fighting for territory and who that are under control of the of government because in the Middle East there are so many so much so many conflicts sometimes that occur there. So is there any possibility for a, like a nuclear terrorism attack or, or it, it may be against government but maybe against a uh, civilian. And would you please uh, explain me more about the Pakistan case also because I'm really concerned about the Pakistan case because they, they, could, they could have some problem in, in this country. Thank you very much. Like, like nuclear uh, terrorism uh, attack also in Pakistan case. Thank you very much. For... Who wish to respond? I wish I could understand the question better. <laughs> the sound wasn't very good. But if the question is the same as in the uh, questions and answers, that was about the possibility of terrorism attack in the Middle East. Yes. And the second one, part of it, where are we concerned about Pakistan and terrorism over there? Is that correct? Yes, yes, this is correct. Irma, maybe you can go first this time. Uh, in terms of possibility, there, there are possibilities in any region in the world. Um, maybe I, I think, given the the identity of the of the groups in the Middle East, that is not very likely in the short term to have this kind of attack. Uh, but uh, as, as I told before, uh, prevention is just to anticipate the situations. So it's important that all we, we said here uh, could be applied also to the um, regions in conflict, because uh, in general, in regions in conflict, uh, there are many other issues that are seen but not specifically uh, the nuclear terrorism. Uh, but uh, if you see the statistics, you see a lot of case of nuclear uh, of uh, terrorist attack in, in, in conflicts, even in the Middle East. So uh, for that reason, I, I put that that chart to to try to see that this is uh, an open question. We we don't have the the response really, but. How would it evolve to, to a nuclear to a nuclear attack? And um, I think that the, the, the conclusion is valid for any, any region, not not specifically for Middle East. And um, concern the the Pakistan case is is the same. Um, in the past, there, there has been some concerns about how Pakistan is protect uh, their nuclear arsenal. But uh, when you talk, when you listen their response, uh, they say that they are very well protected. <laughs> we are uh, we are observing things from outside, and uh, I I I tend to think that uh, uh, all the concepts we 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 gave here are are more general uh, but are at the same time applicable to any country in the world and not to, to a specific uh, region or, or country but of course when you when you have countries with big level of region of, of conflicts we have countries with a, a very um, unstable a political situation uh, countries with um, radical groups uh, operating on them, well, uh, the probability, probability of this uh, kind of uh, event uh, increases, of course, but not, uh, not mostly on the side of the, um, of the theft of nuclear material for an IND, but um, uh, for the intermediate steps of with uh, chemical attack, for example, or uh, RDD uh, use of a radiological source to to to, to have a, a dirty bomb. This is more likely than the the other case that is the the IND. That is 
I don't know <laughs> if it responds your question, but uh, I, I did my best. <laughs> Elena, I think you want to... Maybe uh, what I would add is that uh, I would say that um, both Middle East and um, South Asia, uh, in this respect, I would say uh, are of high concern, particularly because of the uh, many of the terrorist and radical organizations uh, in these regions. Uh, Pakistan is also, as you know, and is a country with the nuclear weapons. Uh, and also pretty elaborate uh, nuclear infrastructure. Um, and there, there are concerns, of course, about the, the potential, but I would say uh, that if we are indeed speaking about possible scenarios, I would agree with Irma that it is more likely to be a radiological dispersal device rather than a, a nuclear weapon. But since we did have Al-Qaeda coming from this region and Taliban uh, who were interested in uh, acquiring uh, WMD, uh, I think that the, the worry is warranted. But um, on the other hand, you know, there, there, there could be in, in any other region. And any other region could be a transit point, it's a safe haven, as Irma was uh, discussing in her original presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we are at the end of our published session. Uh, that doesn't mean that we are at the end of our session. So uh, with the agreement of our two speakers, I hope we can uh, stretch the session for another 15 minutes or so. We have a few more okay. questions. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Gonzalo, uh, do you wish to ask your question? Thank you, Mr. Dupree. Um, my question uh, is actually from uh, a comment uh, made by Ms. Arguello. Um, well, uh, the terrorist uh, topics is very particular to, to say the least, but it was very interesting when Ms. Arguello mentioned the possibilities of cyber attacks into nuclear plants. And although uh, this is still not defined, but uh, allegedly this uh, Iran's Natanz facility was sabotaged by a cyber attack that provoked an explosion due to a malfunction of uh, the gas system. So this dual use of cyber means makes it very dangerous as it can be used by almost anyone. Uh, do you believe that in the future uh, terrorists will move on to use more these uh, cyber attacks? And although you also mentioned, uh, and I fully agree that states will never fully be ready to prevent a terrorist attack, what uh, steps should countries or international organizations take in order to prevent these kind of scenarios? especially having in mind that there are significant gaps in cybersecurity capabilities among states. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Gonzalo. Yes, uh, I, I, I really think that uh, terrorists will uh, attempt uh, with a cyber attack. And uh, I, I, it, Natan's plan has been just uh, a sample of what terrorists could do in, in terms of attacks to, to nuclear facilities. There are many, many groups around the world uh, working on, on that to try to, to see because uh, how, how is that of cyber attacks? Uh, because you have several ways of cyber attacking a, a nuclear facility not only the, the hardware, but all, also the, the, the software and the information, yeah, the nuclear information or nuclear sensitive information. There are many, many ways. And from the, the side of, uh, of any, any state, I, I think that it's essential that um, 
we we always uh, with terrorism go to to raise awareness and understanding because it's essential for the for the governments uh, to 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 establish first to understand how is the nature of cyber attacks uh, how could affect their their interests the national interest and then to to put people to to work on that uh, you have many many states around the world that are, have a big deficit on that much more than other conventional nuclear security practices and i especially recommend uh, uh, to to see uh, when it, it, it will be launched on um, 22 the the nuclear security index because it has a specific part about how countries are uh, concerning uh, their cyber prevention measures cyber uh, related of course to to nuclear so it is it's interesting because you have there a, a whole panel a whole landscape of uh, the situation and an even assessment of your own countries because it covers everything and from that to to begin to think of uh, establish uh, national groups to to work on that and to to set up the uh, the minimum prevention measures that in general are not very costly but the, the most important thing for our region is to begin to understand that the, the, the issue is is very important and it, it never it not all always happen it's not a, a no, no, it's, a, it's not a matter of funding, but of awareness and to understand that uh, the issue is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Irma. Um, we have another question from Carmen. Carmen, would you ask your question, please. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Weyu and um, Ms. Sokova for, for your presentations. You mentioned that um, terrorist groups or other uh, non-state actors groups could, have, could acquire nuclear material in black market. So I was wondering to what extent um, research or intelligence is being made by international organizations, by NGOs, Interpol, uh, states, uh, to track companies' involvement in the legal trade and illegal trafficking of nuclear material. Thank you. I'll, I'll start answering if you don't mind. Uh, <clears throat> a very good question. Um, and there are indeed different uh, uh, efforts to track uh, illicit trafficking of nuclear materials. Uh, first, to start with the overall control over nuclear materials and radioactive materials. These are very controlled substances. You cannot just go on the internet and order uh, a kilo of uranium or a cesium-137 um, uh, device. Uh, some obviously are regulated even more than others, particularly the nuclear materials are strictly regulated. These are uh, intergovernment agreements usually, and uh, there are many other controls. Uh, what is most important uh, is for countries that have these materials and facilities, uh, for them to have a very proper system both of controlling and accounting for these materials and good protection. Um, so what, where material could get lost is mostly is from somebody taking advantage of vulnerabilities in this accounting or protection controlling system. And that's what happened, uh, as I was showing you, in the after the breakup of the former Soviet Union. But these incidents happen globally. If you look at the statistics, for example, the International Atomic Energy Agency maintains a database of illicit trafficking cases. That database, particularly, is where the countries themselves report different incidents. For example, the material was stolen and the country reports to it, or it was a uh, discovery of a material that was actually found by accident, like an orphan source, or there are many other uh, issues, the incidents that go into that database. 
and countries voluntarily contribute into the International Atomic Energy Database. Um, there is also Interpol, uh, you write that there are other organizations that monitor it, that also uh, collects information both from states, but also from uh, media reports, from the police uh, reports, some of them are not necessarily public, countries share it. And if you compare the number of cases in the IAEA uh, database where countries voluntarily compare, contribute and say Interpol, Interpol has probably like two or three times more cases than the IAEA. So there is more that is uh, happening in this uh, field. There are non-governmental organizations that also do track uh, some of these um, cases. And actually, in fact, the Center for Non-Proliferation uh, Studies in Monterey was one of these organizations that was very actively involved in the mid-90s and early 2000s in tracking some of these cases. Uh, at that time, uh, many countries were much more open about reporting uh, these cases in the media. There were plenty of publications so you could get information and even the, some of the regulatory agencies were much more public. Uh, later on, uh, Russia became a little bit more closed in terms of sharing this information in public. But the number of countries are still very good about reporting it and actually using it as a tool to learn both themselves and for the international community to learn from various uh, incidents and vulnerabilities. How can you do better? How can you improve the system so, so that the material could not be stolen or diverted in the first place? So I hope I answered your question. I, I, I would like to add just a conceptual thing for, for you to think after this session. Um, all, all this kind of risk are interconnected. For example, when a nuclear weapons usable material is stolen from a facility, this, user, uh, this material could be used for a country uh, to proliferate or for a, for a terrorist to, to have a terrorist attack. So uh, it is important to, to understand that the risks are uh, interlinked and, uh, and uh, it should be treated. If we have this uh, develop uh, uh, some conceptual model of um, comprehensive reduction of nuclear risk, because uh, I, I think that is the, the future, not to have separately uh, nuclear security, safeguards, safety. So it's important to understand that with the flexibility and globalization, all these things are not separate, but uh, could be uh, used use for different purposes. So it, it could be, it, it, was, it, it, it is better to, to treat uh, them comprehensively and together. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that was a, a very good point, Irma. And in fact, it relates to a point that a question that I wanted to ask and I'll, um, I'll before uh, asking Felix Spencer's question. Um, the, the point here is exactly the, the integration of all these issues. Um, and I've found continuous sort of stovepiping in, in our area. So, you know, the emphasis is, while it's the NPT review conference, and now everything is NPT, NPT. And then, and of course, in the in context of the NPT review, there's a small section there that deals with nuclear security. Uh, it's always kind of, well, it's kind of an afterthought somewhere stuck in the end of the, of the document um, in, you know, main committee three and who knows what they do there anyway and, you know, whatever. Uh, and and I, I'm being a little bit facetious, but that is, that's actually how it works in, 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 the, in the NPT context. So, you know, my question on this is, you know, we've had so much emphasis on the nuclear security summits. Uh, you know, it was, was to a point where everyone almost got fed up about it. But, and it, as, as Elena also mentioned earlier, there were, there were many successes. Um, I think people may not actually admit how successful it was. And 
And now that disappeared. It is no longer the high profile. I enjoyed the, the picture that Irma showed of, of the big round room. You know, it was, was very impressive. Um, so, you know, my question is, how do we make sure that the international attention is still on, on this issue? That because, yes, I mean, we had a discussion yesterday in a, in a different context because we have undergrad students here and I was talking to them about um, how do you negotiate uh, a document? Um, and the point was, you know, you can have very carefully crafted words for NPT final document. Um, and at the end, it means almost nothing because it, linguistically, it doesn't make much sense. Um, so, how, you know, how do we make sure that the issue of nuclear security remains on, on, the, on the front burner, so to speak? So, uh, uh, with that question, I would like to read the question from Felix Spencer. He does not have a microphone. My interpretation of, of the question is he, he, he asked, what treaties through the resolution 1540 have taken place to include the neighboring countries of America that are not included for decision making with this, within this framework. I, I understand from this that it would be what agreements and, and initiatives in the context of 1540. Um, I've asked Felix to, to perhaps clarify, but uh, you see the question there if you wish to uh, respond to, to that and as maybe also to my question. Thank you. Yeah. Would you like that I begin? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, first, uh, I, I totally agree with your view, John, concerning how the, the, the need for integrating all, all this. Um, the, the traditional low participation of nuclear security in the MPT recon. We, as NGO, we, we are the, the freedom to, to try to, to propose new models, uh, sometimes understood, <laughs> some other than not, not very understood, but uh, we, we are fighters in any way because we, we have not the constraint that uh, people in the government have. So, we think that first we think that uh, uh, in MPT Revcom, uh, nuclear security should should have a prominent role, and in because we think that the, in the same way that we we shouldn't uh, treat security, safety, and safeguard separately, we shouldn't treat the three pillars separately because they are very interlinked. So, if you see what is common. Uh, uh, across the three pillars, you, you can see that nuclear security is uh, a common thing that could be a common foundation for the, the, three, the three pillars. We also, we are working in a group to, to try to make next RevCon successful and propose ideas for that. And in this scheme, we are, we are proposing to take some of the good things of nuclear security summit for example, the, the gift basket to propose to, to apply the, um, the joint voluntary commitments we have called like that to the MPT process. Because it's no use to have a final document without any, that, that then is not accomplished because we have very beautiful uh, final documents in the past, RECOMs, but then with, with the, that one of the 13 points, but then the, the points were not accomplished. It's preferable to have a realistic approach on that, to have um, really that the, the final document reflects the agreements and the disagreements about, about the, uh, among the parties because the interests are very diverse, but not to have a, a, a final document or not to have nothing and to, to see that RevCom as a failure. So we are working uh, very much to try to rethink what uh, can you consider as failure or success of the MPT RevCom. So uh, this, uh, uh, how to make it, uh, how to, 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 
to make it uh, present the nuclear security effort. Unfortunately, after nuclear security summit, we we stayed with an unfinished business because the uh, nuclear security summit uh, ends with uh, Obama uh, administration and many of the good intention passed to, to other environments like the um, IAEA ministerial conference that uh, was uh, no, not, not higher level like uh, chief of state but uh, uh, also uh, the, the, the nuclear security contact group and many many groups were uh, I doubt that in uh, to be realistic that uh, right now uh, today with all the situation we are uh, going through with the pandemics it could be a priority for any government in the short term but uh, I think that the, the effort should be done to 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 keep this this flame alive because um, what we that is is uh, inconceivable that we begin to think of that when you have an, any kind of act, a terrorist act of a nuclear security event, and then to begin to to think, oh, we 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 leave the, we left this and now we we have to to catch up the, this. So uh, it's it's difficult in the short term, but. There are many groups uh, working on that. Concerning the, the, the Felix uh, question, I, I, I don't understand very well um, because uh, 1540 is, um, is, uh, is something mandatory for any state. And uh, is, um, I, I think that uh, I, I don't understand very well the question. The, I don't know if uh, you, Elena, uh, because you, they are uh, uh, talking about neighbor, neighboring countries that are not included for decision making within this framework. Well, uh, only only uh, included in the framework are the, the UN Security Council members uh, <laughs> at that moment, and then the, the permanent members. But uh, it's mandatory is uh, for any country. But uh, it's, it's true that there is no uh, mechanism of verification of accomplishment, just uh, the, the, the voluntary uh, reports that states made under the 1540. I don't know if I am understanding well the, the question, Feli's question. What do you say, Elena? I also do not understand it fully, but I think you answered it in a way that I would have answered too. This is a, a mandatory resolution. The way it was adopted is unusual in terms of the international treaty making, because usually treaties are negotiated uh, and, and then they uh, are signed and entered into force. This was done through the Chapter 7 uh, UN Security Council. Um, charter where it was adopted uh, and became mandatory immediately for every single state in the world. Uh, uh, what uh, the way uh, it works also uh, countries supposed to it, actually there is a committee a 1540 committee that developed the whole matrix how the country is supposed to meet obligations under this resolution and countries report on it uh, uh, as Verma said, it's voluntary reporting, nonetheless. Also, the committee that was established uh, also served the purpose of kind of matchmaker. If countries say that they need assistance in certain area of implementation of their uh, various export controls or um, adoption of uh, legislation, relevant legislation, they indicated in their reports and request assistance so that the committee could direct it to somebody else who can provide that assistance. And also the committee has experts that work with the country to help them to implement it better, to prepare their reports better. Um, so it is like every country is under that and it's really taking um, 
the country's initiative itself on how well they're using it, both the resources available and how they implement it. But I'll go to Jean's question about the, uh, obviously, Lord's attention. Yes, um, you, if you have the attention at the heads of state level and uh, after it's gone, the attention drops down and the amount of funding goes down, obviously. So we do have that uh, reduced attention. Um, nonetheless, the, the work continues, and I think the International Atomic Energy Agency, first and foremost, plays a very significant role in, in continuing this work. work. What about the integration of different uh, parts and pillars? I agree with Irma's arguments, but one thing that I also wanted to uh, maybe add that there have been discussions about how we can make uh, review conferences more effective and that if we don't have an agreement on the final document or some part of it, we have a number of agreements on other parts. How we can, we don't throw them away. Uh, particularly there are maybe some good agreements in nuclear security or in peaceful uses, but since we didn't achieve final document, we threw away the whole thing. Um, and there have been proposals, maybe what we could do is have the uh, prep comms focus on specific issues rather than each time we discuss everything and disarmament, Middle East, peaceful uses, safeguards and, and everything else. Why don't we take some of the prep comms and focus on certain issues and maybe over there we can produce some documents and, and agreements that uh, can pay way towards the review conference itself and that will become a separate document on this issue. I don't know, there are many proposals how to make the uh, review process more effective. But I think it does merit a consideration how we can uh, capture and keep meaningful progress and agreements in, uh, say, nuclear security, peaceful uses and not depend on just, uh, we didn't achieve um, final document, then we're not gonna do much in other areas. But to be a little bit on a positive side, is it is because of the work on uh, peaceful users and nuclear security and many other issues continues uh, within the international organizations like the IEE, it's not like everything completely lost. Uh, <laughs> so there are many things that are done and for example those who work in Vienna and then are also asked to contribute to the NPT review process it says they say as like we don't understand we in Vienna work on these issues we already moved ahead like three or five steps and when we come to the NPT review conferences or prep comms the discussion is still catching up or we go to something that was negotiated 10 years ago and we still do the same. So there is a little bit of a disconnect between even within the diplomatic uh, services in the countries between those who focus on certain issues and you know delegations are limited. You have your delegation in New York at review conference mostly those who deal with uh, disarmament and uh, say uh, non-proliferation safeguards issues uh, and not don't have the specialist focused on peaceful users on nuclear security. So that's another issue for many diplomatic services to look at. How can you bring the more uh, comprehensive team uh, or how do we change the uh, process itself so that we don't lose achievements in other areas uh, while we're fighting over the Middle East WMD uh, zone, or we're discussing, uh, rightfully discussing the disagreements on uh, disarmament, but then we keep some of the progress going in other areas. It's just a, a small addition. We, we hopefully will have uh, next year the TPPNM review conference that could be a very good uh, opportunity 
to revive <laughs> the interest for nuclear security. That I think that is a very, very good opportunity that any one of us involved in nuclear security should take advantage of. Good points, uh, both of you. I mean, I, I think, uh, and thanks for reminding us about that. It's, it's a very important uh, conference coming up. Um, I mean, we have uh, three more questions. So I would want to ask the, the panelists, are you willing to take these three questions? Uh, do you have time? Um, I will ask the three uh, persons to ask their questions um, one after the other, and then you can respond and we can close the session. But I just want to make one quick uh, comment about uh, Elena's point. Um, and just also to explain to our uh, diplomats online that, you know, the NPT review conference documents or the process is a making of the members. It's not a requirement to have a final document. It doesn't require that in the treaty at all. This is just a practice that has been established over time. So there is no requirement to say that you have to have one document. Uh, and I've always said that, you know, um, that you can have several documents. Um, NP, the 95 Review and Extension Conference proved that. There were four documents adopted at that conference. Um, so there's no reason why you cannot have a resolution or an agreement uh, or a protocol or whatever you want to adopt in the context of a review conference. So good point. Thanks for making that point, Elena. So uh, I'm going to ask, um, uh, starting with, with Florence from Trinidad and Tobago, and then Nicole, and then Jefferson to briefly ask your questions. And then I will uh, ask our panelists to respond to those, and then we'll close the session. Go ahead, Florence. All right, so Florence might be without a microphone. Um, so her question was, it's, um, several challenges to the way forward were highlighted in your presentations, given the upcoming elections in the United States and the possibility of a Biden administration, what recommendations would you give to a potential new U.S. leader to re-energize efforts towards improving global nuclear security? Uh, Nicole, would you like to ask your question, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you all for your presentations. Um, I'm from Chile, and my question is, in your opinion, how should be improved transparency, transparency in the nuclear field given that the same transparency and the increasing access to information could benefit non-state actors that want to commit criminal or terrorist acts. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And then the last question from Jefferson Forero, and I will read it. While it is true that the international community has been mobilizing and adopting numerous international instruments and arrangements to ensure nuclear security, how do states with nuclear capabilities deal with other international actors seeking to engage in unauthorized development of nuclear weapons? I, I take it that other international actors mean um, non-state actors or um, in the context of nuclear security. So uh, with those three questions, I uh, will ask our panelists to make final comments and then we'll close the session. Thank you very much. Yeah. Concerning the, the the election in the, I will take. Uh, <laughs> concerning the election in the United States, um, it, uh, it will depend on, on the winner, of course. If, if Biden wins, it's, it's expected that some a, a little bit more emphasis on disarmament, non-proliferation, nuclear security, and all that will be put. From, on behalf of the U.S. administration, we can we cannot do we cannot say right now how the, this, the result would be, but it's expected to to retake a little bit more the the line of Obama's administration. I, I can say nothing else about that. Uh, then the Nicole question: uh, How will we improve the transparency? Well, this is a big issue, transparency, because you have the, um, the, 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 the information, the, the restricted information, the, that what, what they say, the industrial secrets of the, of the nuclear industry, uh, is uh, difficult to, to have a, a big and absolute transparency. 
but all the international instruments are designed and I've written and written to protect the, the, the proprietary information, the national information. Even the, the most intrusive instrument like the additional protocols to, to the safeguard agreements, they, they all is designed to protect the, the international the, the, the national information or the industrial information. Uh, in terms of nuclear security, uh, a, a big uh, step forward has been the IPAS missions where um, and the fair reviews where um, fairs go and see how the systems are, but always uh, with the, the, pre, the, the in the process protecting such, uh, such a specific or se a sensitive information. I think that the nuclear issue, uh, complete transparency is not good. Uh, like a, a concept um, you, you, and a, a not responsible concept, but it could be achieved um, a certain a big degree of transparency, protecting the, the information and not put the information to the service of uh, the wrong hands also, because uh, transparency by itself um, means that you, I, and, and the, the terrorists can get the, the information that they shouldn't be in, in any hands. And the, the last one, the international community has been uh, uh, arranged to ensure nuclear security had the state. Well, I, I, I think that uh, our two presentations has been very clear about, about this. I don't know if uh, Elena has to add on this specific point, I, I have nothing to add in the in the Jefferson question, because if you read uh, our presentations, uh, we are uh, suggesting how the international community or how any country should behave to to, to try to to get um, a system uh, as robust as possible. Uh, I, I leave you the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Irma. Uh, uh, quickly, I agree on uh, uh, Biden. If uh, we do have a uh, uh, return of the democratic administration, hopefully, <laughs> in November, uh, it is more likely that uh, there will be a little bit more reinvigoration of these issues. Uh, and particularly because, uh, as you know, during the Obama administration, many people who worked for him that these ideas were coming from some of these experts uh, who worked in the democratic uh, uh, administration. However, having said that, nuclear security has always enjoyed a bipartisan support in the US. Uh, it has never been a, a kind of a divisive issue. So uh, if you look at you know, some of these convention and issues, uh, initiatives came during the Bush administration, during the Republican administration, given that they were right after the terrorist attacks in New York and, and other places. But um, yeah, so short answer, yes, it probably will get a little bit more profile if Biden is elected. On the transparency, fully agree with Irma. Uh, just want to add that when we, we, what do you mean by transparency? Uh, transparency in this sense that you are not saying exactly where your camera is or where your guard is standing. Transparency is about how do you approach the arrangements for uh, nuclear security? Uh, how can specialists in my country dealing with nuclear security can talk to specialists to your country and you share the methodology and how you do it? Uh, approaches, uh, you, you think together about how to improve it, how to assess uh, the threats to your facilities uh, uh, and everything else. And there is a way of sharing like legislation and, and approaches. So it's, it's the, we're speaking about transparency that is reasonable and uh, that would not really undermine any, anyone's security. And also the protection of information is important. Um, so whatever is shared between professionals or during these missions is not getting into out of, uh, to the public, obviously. Uh, and even so, 
and more so uh, the information about specifics for each facility and the arrangement there that should never become public information because otherwise it defeats the purpose. Uh, um, but certain things we are visible, like if you go to a bank and you know, have your monitors, you have your guard, you have uh, whatever barriers and everything else. Same with the nuclear facilities. If you think about nuclear material as being gold in the vault, so you have to <laughs> do all the other arrangements as you do for many other things. Obviously for some of the most secure and higher security facilities and materials. There are many layers of uh, both access and, and physical protection and controls. Something that we, if you saw James Bond movies when you have to kind of scan your eye to open the door, almost at that level. <laughs> so, but um, I'll stop here on the transparency. So balance, and there are ways to do, to be transparent and reassure others of what you're doing and you're doing appropriately. In terms of the last question, I also don't quite understand it, but there are two different issues here that could be mixing up. One is how do nuclear weapon states approach uh, unauthorized development of nuclear weapons? by other states and that you probably had a discussion about the proliferation about Iran or North Korea or other clandestine programs and the other one is unauthorized development by non-state actors and uh, believe me uh, every kind of you know nuclear weapon states because they know what they have and they know the destructive power of the weapons treated very seriously um, uh, I think that uh, obviously you cannot foresee everything and there could be vulnerabilities. That's why nuclear security, one of these areas where the uh, improvements, assessments, uh, exercises are need to be done on regular and almost a constant basis because situation change, the technology change, the terrorist capabilities change, the uh, new ways of I don't know, even we, we talked about cyber, we talked about other uh, new technologies, drones and everything. So you constantly need to improve the security uh, of your facilities and materials. And if you, if you look at many of the initiatives that are put in place in the prevention of nuclear terrorism, um, many of them come from um, United States from uh, the Russian Federation. The two countries have the most of these materials and their territories. Uh, uh, so many of these initiatives are coming from them. Uh, the different issue is how well they themselves <laughs> implement some of this nuclear security arrangement, what they do. Uh, for example, there are cases of severe uh, vulnerabilities and breaches in both countries. In the United States, for example, in uh, what year was it? Um, I forgot, 2006, 2008, one of those, where three activists actually were able to get to the facility, very high security uh, facility in one of the U.S. national nuclear sites in Oak Ridge, which houses uh, 400 kilograms, 400,000 kilograms or pounds, I, know, I think 400,000 kilograms of highly enriched uranium. This is half of the entire highly enriched uranium reserve of the United States, the material perfect for bombs. So these three activists got to the facility through many layers of security. They were standing at the site next to the building. They couldn't get inside the building, that's have to admit. With a uh, poster, with writing something, nobody pays attention to them. They stand there for an hour, they started pounding on the building in the hope to attract attention to themselves. People who worked inside thought these are maintenance workers. And um, only after the pounding continued, some of them got, a, got annoyed and uh, called. It's like, what's going on? How long is going to last? 
Then the security showed up, finally. Uh, and the three, three activists, one of them was an 82-year-old nun. So that tells you that even these big guys, when they know what they have, they can still have security lapses, you know? So it's a never-ending job. Uh, you can take it seriously, you can be a leader in promoting certain initiatives, but you could still have some embarrassing moments. As long as they're just embarrassing moments, they don't lead to something <laughs> worse. <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> okay, I'll stop here. Thank you, Elena. And on that, uh, on that note, which is a very powerful way to, to conclude, it's a very, very thought-provoking. Thank you both for excellent presentations and your willingness to stay on.